Michigan Christian Center. I'm so glad you could join us for our online service. I've got a great word for you, but before we get to that, we've got an online meet and greet. Can you do me a favor? Send a link to our services to as many people as you know. Let's get as many people on a weekly basis watching our services. All right, I'll see you on the other side of meet and greet. Have you ever known someone who's really, really stubborn and they won't change no matter what, or you try to convince them and they're not going to listen no matter how compelling your argument is? I'm sure we've all had people like that that are just stubborn uh, in our lives. And I, I want to minister on that this morning uh, in Romans, uh, the 10th chapter and verse 14 to 21. And I encourage you to take a look at that uh, in your Bibles. Um, but I came across an interesting insight uh, in, in the area of heart surgery and how people are very, very stubborn uh, when it comes to changing. And um, the article was in the magazine Fast Company. And the, 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 basically the article opens with this, this, this line, change or die. What if you were given that choice. What if a well-informed, trusted authority figure said you had to make a difficult and enduring change in the way you think and act? If you didn't, <laughs> your time would end soon, a lot sooner than it had to. Could you change when change really matters, when it really matters the most? Again, pretty compelling opening to, an, to a magazine article. And what's interesting in the article is they trace the odds that people will change after they've had heart surgery. And what they found was nine out of 10 people, if they've had a dramatic heart surgery following a heart attack or, or something like that to clear up their arteries, nine out of 10 don't change. And, and, and what, they, what they talk about here is a well-known study by a Dr. Edmund, or Edward Miller, who was the Dean of the Medical School and CEO of the hospital at Johns Hopkins University. And Dr. Miller studied patients whose heart disease was so severe that they had to undergo bypass surgery every, uh, I'm sorry, and, and basically <laughs> this surgery would cost more than $100,000 if complications arise. Um, and so the, when this procedure takes place, it relieves chest pains, but it rarely prevents heart attacks or prolongs lives. In fact, what they found was uh, around half the time, those that have received this bypass surgery, the bypass grafts clog up in a few years, uh, the angioplasties in a few months. And, and so basically what they, you know, th these individuals that had these surgeries were challenged with something is that, is that basically you've got to change your life, your diet, your, your exercise regimen or lack thereof, it's got to dramatically change. And, and what they found was if you look at people after coronary artery bypass grafting two years later, 90% of them have never changed their lifestyle. In, in other words, even if you've recovered from a really, really bad disease and you're trying to prevent another one, most people will never change their lifestyles. Again, that's a great example of stubbornness, a great example of, hey, listen, I, I, I was dealing with a life-threatening disease and I had the chance to change and I refused to do so. That, that, that is a great example of stubbornness. Now, as, as we continue here in, in the book of Romans, we've been in chapter 10 for the last couple of weeks, and over and over again, Paul, seems, Paul tells us that the Jews, when presented with the gospel in the first century, in, during Paul's lifetime, have rejected it over and over and over again. In fact, by the time we come to this section of scripture, it, it really seems like overkill. But, but if we understand what Paul's trying to do, he's trying to drive home some really important lessons that if we've got eyes to see and we've got ears to hear, we're going to hear and we're going to see what God 
is trying to say. And so what we're talking about here in this section of scripture is lessons from a stubborn people. It's never fun to find someone who's stubborn, but can we learn something from them? And can we learn from God's response to that stubbornness? So let's read Romans 10, the 14th chapter through verse 21. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can, they not, how, they, how can they believe in the one in whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. But I ask, did they not hear? Of course they did. Their voice has gone out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Again, I ask, did Israel not understand? First, Moses said, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation. I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. And Isaiah boldly says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. But concerning Israel, he says, all day long I have held up my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. <laughs> if that's not a great statement, that last sentence about stubbornness, I don't know what is. <laughs> a disobedient and obstinate people, a stubborn people. But we can learn some lessons from Israel's rejection of the gospel. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time together in your word. And Father, I'm asking and praying that God, as I share your word this morning, and we look into Romans 10, verses 14 to 21, God, give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear what your spirit desires to speak to us. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So let's look into this, in this section of scripture here. Okay, the first uh, point that Paul is driving at is despite stubborn refusal, God still reaches out to the lost. I mean, I mean, think about that for a moment. God knew that the Jews of the first century, following the, the death and resurrection of Jesus, God knew that they were going to reject the gospel, and yet he still reached out to them. And again, this section of scripture here in Romans 10, 14 to 15, is a favorite missionary scripture or evangelism scripture, right? Is this idea that one must be sent, <laughs> one must preach the good news. Those to whom a person is sent and, and you know, is, is meant to hear this message. They're, they're, they're supposed to believe the message. They're supposed to call on the Lord for salvation. And all of that is true. And Paul would indicate that, yes, it's important to preach the gospel. After all, that's exactly what he's been doing. But what we need to understand in this section of scripture, in its context, Paul is not advocating evangelism here. And Paul is not primarily advocating missions work here, even though it appears to do so. What Paul is trying to say is, listen, God has already been missional to the Jewish people. God has already been evangelistic to the Jewish people. God has sent people like the Apostle Paul and others to preach the gospel, but the Jews have not believed it. That is the key issue in Romans 10. The emphasis here is not, let's go out and send people out in missions, even though that, of course, is really important. That's not what Paul is driving at. God is trying to say, listen, I've already done my part. <laughs> the onus is on the Israelites. They've rejected this gospel. And, and that's the fly in the ointment, right? That's the fly in the ointment is that God has reached out to them and they have rejected the call to believe the gospel. They still are beholden to the Old Testament. They're still beholden to the Mosaic covenant, the law, the legal system. And yet what we see here is the loving grace and patience of God. And in other words, if, if you knew that someone would reject your love, would you keep loving them? If you knew that someone would not, have, would not want to have anything to do with you, would you keep on being patient with them? Would you keep reaching out to them? Would you keep loving them? Would you keep blessing them? Would you keep encouraging them? In other words, even the most pious of us would eventually have to be candid and honest and say, listen, there comes a time where I'm like, hey, <laughs> you know, I'm done with this. You're not going to receive? Forget about it. But what we see here is, again, the sobering example of a stubborn people. 
but we also see the loving and gracious patience of a good God that desires them to be saved. In fact, this is exactly why Paul quotes this scripture where he talks about, he says, as it is written in Romans 10, 15, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. What Paul has been doing here, he's quoting Isaiah 52, verse seven, where, where God has already reached out to the Jewish people and they rejected God in Isaiah's time and guess what? They're rejecting God in Paul's time as well. Let me read Isaiah 52, seven. It says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. And so in its original context, Isaiah had depicted a herald running across the mountains surrounding Jerusalem to bring the good news of victory over their enemies to God's people. And Paul understood this very same proclamation as something that he and the other apostles were doing in his own time frame. And in fact, it's interesting how beautiful are the mountains, on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. That word beautiful in the Greek refers to something at its chronological prime. It's something that's ripe. It's something that at the just the right time, when people are most receptive, that's when the gospel has gone to the Jewish people. In other words, God knew exactly when the Jewish people would be most receptive of the gospel, and that's when he sent people to them to preach the gospel, people like the Apostle Paul and others. And yet the incredible irony and the incredible sad fact was at the time when they were most chronologically primed, and supposedly open to the gospel, they started doing this, la, 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 right? I'm not interested, I don't want that. In other words, the fault lies with Israel and not with God, and yet God kept reaching out to them. Okay, so, so, so what's our first lesson? <laughs> Despite stubborn refusal, God continues to reach out to a stubborn people. Second of all, we can learn from Israel's rejection of the gospel that saving faith comes exclusively by hearing the word of Christ. Look what it says in Romans 10, 17. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of Christ, okay? I've heard this scripture preached hundreds of times in churches uh, that I've been in part of, whether I was living in Michigan, whether I was living in Illinois, or whether I was in Bible school in, um, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And of course, I was close to the Word of Faith movement and, and in churches connected with them. For goodness sakes, I went to Ramo Bible Training Center and went to many services there and heard Kenneth Hagin himself preach. And many times this scripture has been used to, to, to help build up people's faith. But that is not, that is not, that is not what Paul's getting at here. The context of Romans 10, 17 is evangelism. It's not building up a believer's faith, but listen, the word of faith coming is this idea that, 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 that you know, um, people need to hear the gospel. People need to receive the gospel and the saving faith that, that saves people comes exclusively from the preaching of the gospel. That's what Paul is driving at here. He's not focused on pre-existing believers. Faith comes by hearing and hearing comes from the word. You need to be under the word. You need to be under the ministry of the word. You need to be under services and sermons that build up your faith. Now, do services and sermons build up your faith? Absolutely they do. That's just not Paul's focus here. And that's, we need to keep our eyes on the ball and we need to interpret the scriptures correctly. And what Paul's trying to say is it's the word of Christ. It's the gospel, right? The life, ministry, death, resurrection of Jesus calls every person to account, right? In other words, it calls every man, woman, and child who has ever lived to account to the Lordship of Jesus. Are you gonna receive this gospel? or are you going to reject that? Now, what's interesting here is that this is in contrast to something called natural revelation. There's two types of revelation by which God speaks to people. There's special revelation, the word of Christ, the gospel, the actual scriptures, where we specifically talk to people from the scriptures about God's revelation through Christ to save the human race. But there's also something a little more distant, and that's something called natural revelation, right? That, that's how God speaks through the, you know, in the stars, in the sky, through, through, through the created order, through the intelligent, 
design of the created order that yes, there really is a God, okay? And, and what Paul is trying to contrast here is the only way, the only way you're gonna to come to know Jesus, the only way you're gonna be in a right relationship with God is through the word of Christ, through the specific proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can't get that from the stars. You can't get that from the heavens. You can't get that from a rainbow. You can't get that from a thunderstorm. You can't get that from trees in the oceans, right? Even though the scripture says in Psalm 19, verse one, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Okay, so, so, so there is a revelation that God truly is alive and that God is real and that the creation points to a creator. This is something that, you know, back in the 1800s, William Paley uh, basically advocated this idea that, listen, if you're walking through the forest and you all of a sudden see a watch, right? <laughs> you're gonna realize, wait a minute, that watch wasn't there randomly. That watch wasn't there just haphazardly. Somebody had to create the, the you know, the, the, the mechanics of that watch. The complexity of that watch was not there randomly. Someone had to design it. Or as Paley would say, a watch is to a watchmaker as a universe is to a creator, right? All of that, all of that is really, really important. And, and the created order reveals that there truly is a God. However, we know from scripture, in fact, Paul has already said this in Romans chapter one, that though there is revelation naturally in the natural world, people suppress that truth and unrighteousness and something more has to be given to those that are unbelievers, something more than natural revelation. This is what Paul says in Romans 1, 18 to 20. Let me read it here. He says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth in their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. Well, how has he made it plain to them? Through the created order. He goes on to say, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, they've been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. Right? We know from the rest of the scripture that what happens is if people don't worship the living God, if they don't give God his due, they will start looking toward idols and start worshiping idols, right? They'll suppress the truth and unrighteousness. So this is Paul teeing up the gospel. Why do we need the gospel? Why do we need to preach the gospel? Because humanity in its rebellion towards God, even though God reveals himself in the created order, they suppress this truth and unrighteousness. They go after idols. So this is where we need something called special revelation, right? The gospel of Jesus Christ. This idea that, listen, we need to preach the, the, you know, about the shed blood of Jesus on the cross and, and, and the scriptures and how they reveal those types of things. People need more light. People need more specificity. People need the preached word, the, the, the gospel of, 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 of Jesus and his resurrection is what truly, truly saves us, right? That's really important. Again, Paul, once again, remember, the entirety of the book of Romans is Paul making a case for the gospel. People need to hear that gospel, even if they reject it, even if they're stubborn, even if they refuse it, you've got to have the gospel preached to them. This is why Paul says in Romans 1 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone that believes, first for the Jew, then for the Greek, or then for the Gentile. So he's making a case again for the gospel. And he's trying to see, listen, natural revelation is not enough because people are rebellious, they suppress that truth, okay? The third lesson we can learn from the stubborn people that are the Jews is that we can find a sobering insight into their stubbornness, in other words, what God is doing behind the scenes, and hopeful possibilities as well, okay? And again, the, the idea here, again, the, the sobering insight is simply this, is that the Jewish rejection of the gospel is a rebuke to everyone who's skeptical of, of Jesus and skeptical of Christianity, right? He says this in Romans 10, 18. But I ask, did, not, did they not hear? Of course they did. Their voice had gone out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. What's Paul talking about here? Well, he's talking about two things at least. He's talking about natural revelation. Every sunset, 
every sunrise, right? Every rainbow, every sunny day, every cloudy day, whatever that is in creation, right? That word is speaking to everybody. In fact, Roman, or I'm sorry, Psalm 19 says day after day, that speech goes out into all the world. It doesn't matter where you are, you're hearing that speech. In other words, that points to a creator, but it also, this scripture in Romans 10, 18, doesn't just point to natural revelation, it points to the special revelation, the preaching of the gospel, right? They did hear that. And so humanity is completely and totally without excuse. And so again, th th this points to a question that maybe you've dealt with, I know I have, as I've shared the gospel throughout my life. Well, what about people that have never heard the gospel? What about that, right? Is that fair of God to condemn them to hell forever? How, fair, how loving is God if he does that? And again, Paul is, is challenging that here because again, remember, he's already written in Romans 1, uh, 20, that listen, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities have been revealed in the created order, but men have rejected that, so they are without excuse. That's a rebuke to every skeptic. That's a rebuke to every person that has not heard the gospel, is that, listen, God will judge those that have heard the truth and yet have rejected it, more severely than those who have never heard. In fact, this is what I've always done when I've talked to people that have, that have thrown that back at me and said, listen, I'm not gonna believe in your Jesus because listen, how fair is God that he would send people that have never heard about him to hell? And to me, that, that, that is a smoke screen. Listen, <laughs> I don't know about those people. What I do know is I'm currently talking to you. What I do know is I've currently shared the gospel. The, the, the issue is not so much those that have not heard, but how about you, my friend? What are you gonna do with the light that you've been given? Because you will be judged by God more severely by rejecting the light that you do have. Now, I personally believe that every person will be judged in the light that they've received, that those that have never heard the gospel, God's gonna take that into consideration. I'm mindful of what, what it says in, in um, Genesis chapter 18 as, as Abraham is dealing with this issue that he knows that God is gonna destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of their perversions and, and, and their sins. And, and, and what God ends up saying, revealing to him is, er, is that, listen, I'm the just judge and I will do what is right. And I believe that about every person that has not heard the gospel. But more to the point, but if you have heard, you will be judged more severely. And the Jews who have rejected the gospel in Paul's day are a sobering object lesson for all of us that have heard the gospel and perhaps are rejected. In fact, this is what Jesus said in Luke the 10th chapter, verses 13 to 14. Woe to you, Chorazin, Woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable with, for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. So we've got to recognize that as we've shared the gospel with people and they've rejected it, listen, there is severe judgment coming on them for rejecting that light. So we need to keep praying for them. We need to keep talking to them. We need to keep persuading them and, and trusting that God will begin to move in their lives. Again, this is a sobering lesson that we need to realize God is not mocked. A man or a woman will reap what they sow. We will be judged by the light that we've received. And the other lesson that this, this communicates to us is simply this, that we should be filled with hope that the church's message of salvation will eventually cover the earth, right? In other words, this whole context here of what Paul's talking about in Romans 10 is this idea that God has reached out and reached out and reached out and reached out to the Jewish people. In fact, it says the message has gone to the ends of the world. If he's done that for the Jews, God's no respecter of person. He'll do that for the non-Jews. That message is going forth. And what that should do is prompt us as Christians, it should prompt me as a Christian, hey, what am I doing to share the gospel? What am I doing to share Jesus with those that don't know him? Am I inviting people to church? Am I inviting people to Christ? Remember the bless initiative we talked about a few years ago, right? This idea that every single week, bless three people, right? Three people, do, do, do something to bless three people. Listen to the Holy Spirit's voice as you're doing that. Eat missionally with other people. You're gonna eat anyway during the week. Well, if you do, invite a non-believer to lunch or talk to somebody who's a non-believer as you're eating lunch. 
Study Jesus and how he evangelized the lost in the Gospels and journal what God is doing and what you can do to share the Gospel. In other words, I think a lesson we can learn from, from, from the Jews rejecting the gospel is that we need to be more intentional in sharing the gospel ourselves. We need to be more intentional reaching out to people. We need to be more intentional blessing people. We need to bless people so that they begin to ask, why are you doing this? And then if somebody asks, why are you doing this? Why, for goodness sakes, it's like the ball is teed up. You can tell them, listen, because Jesus loves you and I wanna talk to you about Jesus and I wanna talk to you about what he's done for you on the cross and why you need to give your life to Christ. So, so, so there's lessons we can learn from a stubborn people, right? We can learn that, hey, despite a person's stubborn rejection of the gospel, God keeps reaching out to them. We can learn that, listen, the only way a person's gonna be saved is through the word of Christ. People have got to hear the gospel. And finally, is that we can, we can realize that, listen, people are gonna be judged for their rejection of the gospel, but it should also prompt us to be faithful in praying for the lost, reaching out to the lost, blessing the lost, doing our part to, to share the gospel in every setting we are in. In other words, remember the theme of Romans over and over again is preach the gospel, share the gospel, declare the gospel, make sure the gospel spreads throughout the earth, and we all need to do our part in the midst of it. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you for this section of scripture that it should prompt us to, to recognize your love for the lost, even though they refuse to hear many times. It should prompt us to share the gospel and that people are not necessarily gonna receive <laughs> if, if all they get is natural revelation. We've got to have something specific, the gospel of Jesus. And this should prompt us to bless other people, to realize that, listen, the gospel is continually going forth and God wants to use us to bless others, to share the gospel, to do our part to reach the lost for Jesus. And so, Father God, I pray you would give us courage. I pray you would give us boldness. I pray that you would open up our eyes to see opportunities that are before us, Father God, in all we are and all we do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And God's people said, amen. Well, church, it was great being with you. And until next week, I call you blessed. Take care.